Well, good morning. morning. We had a great service this morning, and I'm assuming that God's Spirit is going to do the same. My name's Tom Noblet, and I want to welcome everybody here this morning. And you are? My name's Kelsey. And you have some announcements for us? I do. Um, If you're visiting with us, we want to say welcome. We are so glad you're here. We think there's nowhere better you could be. So we have a couple announcements first just for you. After service, if you want to stop by our information center, we have new guest brochures. Inside those brochures, you can find some coupons for a free beverage and a free t-shirt and also just more information about the church. So please feel free to grab one of those after service. Also, we don't take an offering together in service. Um, We really want this service to be our gift to you, so we ask that you not give. But if you call Oak Ridge your home and you want to freely surrender what God's given you, there are joy boxes throughout the campus, and you can also give online on our website. So um, feel free to check that out. And then lastly, we do not take communion together in service, but there's a room right behind me called the Reflection Room. Um, There's communion offered in there. There's Bibles. There's a prayer wall. Um, Just a quiet environment for you to connect with God in a new way that we don't necessarily do together in service. So feel free to grab that or check that out after service. Next, unfortunately, there's no edge tonight. Boo. (laughs) You you guys seem like you're going to be doing something else tonight. You don't really care. I didn't get much of a response. But next week, we are starting strong. We are, we are trying to pack the house again. Um, that was our hashtag. We did that a couple months ago, and we're doing it again next week. We want to get 500 students here. So if you've been and you've quit going or you've been curious about it and never checked it out, I encourage you guys to go next Sunday. It's going to be a great week, a great time to jump in with us. Parents, if you've never checked it out, if you're curious, I would strongly encourage you. I think it's a great Sunday. It's a powerful Sunday, and I think next Sunday is going to be really awesome. Yep. We got some books since it's February. We put some books on sale at half off, so I just wanted to share those real quick since it's, we're going to be talking about love. This series called How to Love Like Jesus is a phenomenal series. You're going to get the first part of it today. Uh, but here's some books that are The Five Love Languages and Love Does by Bob Goff. One's regularly 15 and one's regularly 17. And then they're on sale for $7.50 each. Uh, so you can get those. And the other one is how many of you guys have picked up a few LBSs? Uh, during January, a few pounds during January. We have the book, The Daniel Plan. It's ready $25. It's also on sale for $7.50. And for those of you that are looking for a gift for your Valentine, we, are doing, we, we only do this once or twice a year, but we're putting all the clothing in the bookstore and sell for 25% off this week only and next week only. And uh, guys, if you buy something from Oakbridge for your uh, special person in your life, then I would encourage you to give another dozen roses along with it, okay? So that's what we've got going there. So it's going to be a great time for you. We also have a baptism service that I wanted to let you guys know about. That's uh, next Sunday. It's at 4 o'clock. You can still sign up for it. And Kelsey, we believe that everybody that's been baptized should be, should be, everybody that believes should be baptized after belief. We should be a one-to-one correlation. At least that's what we think scripture teaches. And you can sign up for that. But with that said, we'd like to see a little story from uh, one of our last baptisms and how it means a lot to somebody to make a public statement of faith that they love Jesus Christ and they trust him through this uh, thing called baptism. So please watch the screens. Um, Almost two months ago, after about five days of continued migraines, no sleep, and other issues, it was necessary to go to an urgent care facility. After some questions and ruling out some common areas of concern, the recommendation was to perform a CAT scan of my head. Fortunately, the urgent care had a CAT scan on site. Um, Within 15 minutes after the radiologist reviewed the scan, the doctor came in and and stated, we don't have good news. You have a large mass in your brain and we need to get to the emergency emergency room as soon as possible. So really that plan, although the news was tough and initially uh, the natural human questions are why me or what did I or we do to deserve this, among other questions, quickly, Uh, My questions and thoughts turned to God and his son Jesus, and I was confident and comforted there is a faithful plan. And that preparation had already been underway. All things are possible with God and through Jesus. My decision was to open up my arms to Jesus and be accepted into his loving arms and his master plan. Again, very comforting, and honestly, the last two months have been rewarding and positive despite human circumstances. Sundays are my favorite day of the week, coming to Oak Ridge, hearing the message, the practical application and perspective, and of course the phenomenal music tied to the message and theme. So Oak Ridge is a key part of God's plan, preparation, and promotion of Christ's followers. More importantly, the people at Oak Ridge who have been 
so supportive in prayer, encouragement, and in many other ways. Some I have known for a few days, weeks, months, or years, and the support has been phenomenal. In closing, my arms are open to Jesus. I know his arms are open to me, and I'm ready and excited to be baptized this afternoon. Congratulations to all those being baptized today, and thank you, everyone, for your witness and support. Amen. This morning, we're going to have some baby dedications for you. We get to hear these stories, which are powerful, and they're all unique to everybody, and they're real, and they're true. But before we do, I want to give you just a couple quick updates. You can see out front in the children's wing right now, they've added on all the concrete. All the steel is arriving this week. Within the next two weeks, you'll start to see the structure actually being formed. At least that's the plan of it, so we're in full growth mode there. And I wanted to give you an update on Festus. The contract expired December 31. We weren't able to come to an agreement with them since then. So right now, the, that location that we had is not under contract right now. It doesn't mean it's gone away. It just means right now there's still uh, work to do on where God wants us to go with the second campus. So we would encourage you guys to still pray about it. And we know that he's got it in control and that his spirit will guide us. And so with that said, I want to say a quick word of prayer as the, the uh, people come up to get their babies dedicated. Father, just thank you for this time. Touch our hearts. Help us learn to love like your son Jesus during this whole service. Help us to learn to love in conflict and in forgiveness and in everyday life, Father. We thank you. I pray your blessings upon these families and their uh, dedication to raise their children to know your son as best they can. Uh, bless this time. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Katie? Hi, good morning. I'm Katie, and we've got some baby dedications for today. So if Amanda and Steve could come on up, and then Dan and Melissa and Donnie and Heather and Steve and Tina and Josh and Ashley. You guys can just kind of come up. You guys are going to go in that order. So while they're coming up, um, I'll let you guys know we had our first ever parent conference this past week, and it was awesome. Yes, we had over 200 yeah. parents here on Thursday night and Saturday morning, and we just had a really great time. So um, we're going to kind of continue in that spirit by having some of our um, parents um, dedicate their kiddos to be raised um, in the Lord. So I'll have Amanda and Steve. You guys can come on up, take center stage, and you guys go first. Dear little mister, it's mommy, daddy, and sissy. We cannot believe you've been with us for six months. We and sissy are so excited when we found out about you. God gave us a special gift when he gave us you. You are a child of the most high God, and we are so thankful God chose us to be your parents. Today we are dedicating you, Caleb Joseph Pyatt, as a child of God. To dedicate means to set apart for a certain purpose. This is the day that we make a promise to you and to God in front of our family and friends. We promise that mommy and daddy are committed to setting an example for you. We dedicate our lives to teaching you how to live according to God's word, how to seek him passionately and authentically, and how to help you discover your purpose on this earth. We promise to do our best to raise you knowing God's love. Your daddy and I want you to know Jesus. We pray that we, along with your sissy, are faithful examples in your life. Caleb, your name means wholehearted. Caleb was a man from the Old Testament who the Lord said has a different spirit and had followed him fully. When others did not trust in God's ability to deliver them, Caleb chose to follow God fully, trusting him. It is our prayer for you. <laughs> that you will choose to follow God fully and wholeheartedly, even if others around you choose differently. We pray that you will be guided by truth and will grow in your knowledge that is good and right while staying honest and humble to everyone whose paths may cross yours. We pray that you de develop friendships and that during your journey through life, we will be able to extend grace to all of the lives that you meet. We pray too that you will have joy and laughter in your life, that you will live your life not in fear, but in trust because the truth that guides you. You bring us so much joy, sweet boy. We are overwhelmed by the blessing that the Lord has given us, but also the responsibility of what we have to teach you. Our number one priority is to make sure you see God and his love through us every day. We want you to be free to follow wherever God leaves you. Start your children off on the way they should go, and even when they are old, they will not turn from it. Proverbs 22, 6. We love you, and your sissy loves you. Mommy and Daddy. That was awesome. Thanks, Amanda. So Dan and Melissa, you guys are going to come up next. What's cool is I've known Amanda since I was born, so it's fun to watch her dedicate her little guy. All right, Dan and Melissa. All right. I figured it was either going to be a dedication or a four-minute rap solo, so I'm still kind of tossing that up. We decided the latter. Elijah, your mother and I are thrilled and humbled to be your parents and to have the opportunity 
to raise you, uh, to raise you and start you on your journey through this life. It was with that journey in mind that we gave you the name Elisha, which means my God is Yahweh. We wanted it to help serve as a constant reminder to you of the narrow path that our Lord Jesus spoke of and that your mother and I desire for you. We're excited to be on this journey with you and promise to do our best to raise you to be loving, faithful, and wise so that you might be good seed on good ground and grow to be of great service to our Lord. It's our prayer that God will give us the wisdom, the courage, and the strength to raise you for him and that he would help to instill, help us to instill in you the best parts of ourselves. As your parents, we promise that you will grow up knowing that you're loved, loved by us, loved by your family, but most importantly, that you were first and most deeply loved by God. It's in that love that the day we publicly acknowledge our Lord Jesus Christ and dedicate you to him. Okay, Donnie and Heather are gonna come up and dedicate Emery. Proverbs 22.6 says, Train up a child in a way they should go, and they will not depart from it. Dearest Emery, we knew the day you were born that God had put you on this earth for a reason far greater than any of us knew. Today, as your parents, we make a promise to you to keep God as the center of our home and to lead you on this wonderful path that he has laid out for you. We promise to help mold you into the amazing, strong woman that we know God put on this earth to do amazing things. With God on your side, the possibilities are endless, Emery. We promise that life will not always be easy. You will trip and you will fall. You will fail time and time again. You will have times of pain. But as long as you are living your life, serving our amazing God and walking the path he has set, life will be beautiful. That was awesome. Thanks, guys. Okay, Steve and Tina, if you guys want to come on up, come on up. Come on up. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is my daughter, Brooklyn, and this is our daughter, Callie Weber. Um, we also have an almost two-year-old that we've dedicated here, and we're very glad to dedicate Miss Brooklyn tonight, too. I had it out. Hold on. Brooklyn and Callie Weber, we're here today to bind a covenant to you as your parents. We vow to keep you connected to this church through your childhood, as this church has helped your parents immensely. We know it will do the same for you. This church has taught us who Jesus truly is. Jesus, our Lord and Savior of life. We vow to do our best to show you who he is. The single most important thing we could do is your parents. We fully believe in the power of this church. That's because we fully believe Jesus runs this church our true father and our true teacher. As it says in Romans 12, 4 and 5, for just as we have many members in one body and all the members do not have the same function, so we, who are many, are one body in Christ and individual members of one another. There is no other place we would want our girls to be brought up than in the body of Christ to be influenced by the church. Thank you, Jesus, and thank you, Oak Ridge. We love you, girls. Okay, and finally, we've got Josh and Ashley Outman. They're going to be dedicating Piper this morning while pregnant with their fourth daughter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Piper Matilda. What do you want to be in this world? Over the course of your life, you'll be faced with decision after decision, and the sum total will amount to be the person you become. Who you are is not what others want you to be or how you're perceived. And our sincere hope is that you become a reflection of decisions made in Jesus Christ. Daily, your mother and I will fall short as your earthly parents, but in Jesus, you'll have a constant reminder of what you can be, a wonderfully and beautifully made child of the Most High God. The world can be tough and you will have troubles. And as your parents, we will 
to our fullest ability protect you, help you, and guide you with love and wisdom. We are so blessed and thankful that God chose us to be your parents, and we will do everything in our power to raise you to know and love your Creator. 1 Samuel 1, 27-28 We prayed for this child, Piper, and the Lord has granted us what we asked of him. So now we give Piper to the Lord. For her whole life, she will be given to the Lord. That was great. So thank you guys. I'm going to go ahead and pray for us, and then uh, we'll, we'll continue on. God, today I just want to come to you and just say thank you. Thank you for these families, um, that they've made a commitment to themselves and to everyone that's here today, and, and certainly to you, God, that they're going to raise their kids um, in a home that puts you first. They're going to teach their kids to love you and to love others. And God, we're just so thankful for that. Thank you for giving us the church as a place where we can partner with parents to have a strategy for how to raise our kids to know about you and your love and your grace and your truth. So I just thank you for these families that were here today. I just pray a blessing upon them. And um, again, just thank you for Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks. I love baby dedications, and I love when they uh, give a name that has a biblical meaning to it. I love that. I, uh, any of you guys knew this, but I was named with the name Tom, and the, the biblical meaning for that was, is, oh, beautiful one. And, uh, well, that's not true. That's, uh, that's a lie. It's just Tom. Sorry. My bad. We get the opportunity now, and we don't have to cry out. We can stand up sit down and know that our God is with us. That when we gather together in his name, he says, I'm there. I'm in your midst. And I want to touch your heart. I want to give it peace or joy or hope or love. I want to recreate in you something that maybe is withered during the week for six days. I want to recreate. And some of you, maybe it's for the first time he wants to touch and create. We get the opportunity to sing a song, a new song to Oak Bridge. And it's a, it's a beautiful song. But one of the things that I I uh, kind of want to park on for a second is, is when you're down and, and things aren't going your way, it could be a loss of a job, a health, relation, relationship issue, whatever it is, sometimes our tendency is to think through how to fix all this or to worry about it as if that's going to change something. I think that's been a common tendency towards people throughout the ages. But 3,000 years ago, the psalmist wrote something that I think should be our first reaction. And he wrote these words, they're preserved for us. So if right now you're in a, 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 a time period where you think, oh, there's really no solution, this is an impossibility, there is one that we can turn to, who there's no degree of difficulty with him. He knows our future, he knows our past, he knows what he wants to do in our life, and he's fully capable of doing that. And it's found in Psalm 121, verses 1 through 2. But I'm going to ask all of us, to read this aloud together, just as if it's written and read 3,000 years ago by the psalmist. Psalm 121, verses 1 through 2, full voice. I lift my eyes up to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord. I lift my eyes up. In this song, there's a verse that I just wanted to park on, and it says, Hallelujah, our God reigns. Hallelujah is an expression of praise. Yes, way to go. Imagine that the Cardinals win the World Series. Game's tied, seventh game, and they hit a home run. You stand up, you go, yes, yes. It's almost like going, Hallelujah, praise you, our God reigns. So today, if you're in the valley, cry out to God. He reigns, he reigns. He reigns. Stand up, say hello to somebody around you, and let's sing this new song to our king.
Stay standing for a moment. Please stay standing. You know, before we got in this building four years ago, this was a Ford dealership. And uh, every place that you're standing on and every wall that you look at in this room has had scripture written on it somewhere in here. Now it's carpeted over, but it's still there. It's painted over, but it's still there behind us here. And there's one spot in this building that uh, struck me particularly because it said Ford and their, idea, and their slogan was, a better idea. So I knew that uh, something was going on in this place when somebody got up there and they wrote the above Ford, a better idea, and they painted over the F and they put an L. The Lord, a better idea. And I realized at that moment that God was taking this space and making it holy ground, set apart for him. That this space, the ground that you're standing on, is every bit as holy as when Moses stood at the foot of the mountain to go meet God. It's every bit as holy as the ground before the foot of the cross. God has set this apart for you to come into relationship with him through his son, Jesus Christ. To know his son more. To trust and follow his son more. In love and hope and joy and forgiveness. And this God who knew this place was going to become holy ground and more than just a building. I think this God, who we call our Father, would love to hear from you in prayer, in petition this morning. As you, if you've sung out to Him, uh, you can cry out to Him. You can speak to Him in your heart. And I think God's here. He's here in our midst. I want to give you a moment just to do whatever you need to do with God right now, to thank Him, to plead with Him, to praise Him, whatever it is. Take a moment, please.
Father, as we stand on this holy ground that you've set apart, we thank you. We thank you for the time where we recognize who you are, where we're on a journey trying to figure out who you are. We thank you that when we're faithless, you're faithful. We thank you that your love never diminishes for us. When our reactions, when the way we live should diminish it, but it doesn't. You love us, Father. And the proof of that is always your son, Jesus. We thank you for his life, his death, and his resurrection. I thank you, dear Father, that you touch our hearts as we open them up to you. May it be so again uh, as we hear your word. Father, we thank you for this day and this time and this place. May you bless all the people here and watching online as well, Father. It's in your son's name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Please take a seat. Good morning. How are you guys all doing today? You know, right off the bat, I want to tell you, I hope today um, is a convicting message. That's kind of the way that I constructed it. I hope that today leads us to repentance, that we let God's word speak to us, and, and if necessary in this area, that it puts, on a, it puts us on a corrective pathway. And, and so I want to just, just zone in on something, and I want to get something straight. I, I want each of us today to resist the temptation to think of someone else. I don't want you sitting out there and thinking, boy, this would be a great message for my husband or my wife or, or my kids or my neighbors or, or maybe even your enemies. But I want you to focus on you alone. Let God speak to you through these stories, through these words. And, and uh, no, I wish John or Mary were here. Uh, focus on your own heart. Okay, deal? We good with that? All right. So this morning, um, I'm going to be reading a few stories. And, and we're going to be referring to the Pharisees in these stories. And some of you might know who those are but some of you might not. Um, and the Pharisees were a religious group in Jesus' day. And they believed the Old Testament. They knew it backwards and forwards. And, and they tried really hard to keep the laws of God. So uh, as a matter of fact, they would make laws upon laws to help them keep the laws that God established. So on the outside, um, they, they looked really good. They had it all together. They knew the Bible. And in today's terms, I mean, they were the ones that they didn't cuss. They didn't smoke. They didn't drink, they didn't dance, they went to church regularly, they gave a, a portion of their money to the church every week. Um, they were really serious about following God's laws. They were very religious. And I know in my own spiritual walk, I've had some pharisaical tendencies, and I think maybe some of you have as well. And, and those are the things that we want to address this morning. So, um, but Jesus, he often clashed with these people in Scripture. Even though that they were rule followers, uh, Jesus had a problem with them many times, and he called them whitewashed tombs. He said, on the outside, you look really good, and people think you have it together, but inside, inside where it matters, you are dead. He called them hypocrites. He said that they were outside of the kingdom of God, that they were blind to the things of God. He said that they were greedy, self-indulgent fools. He called them sons of hell. Can you imagine the religious leaders of the day? He said, you are sons of hell. He said that they strained the gnat but they swallowed a camel. So they focused on, on the outward things rather than the more important things. I think they missed uh, really what love was all about. And Jesus, in, in Matthew chapter 22, um, he has an encounter with, with a Pharisee, and, and we're going to read, and starting with verse 34. It says, Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, which was another religious group that we won't get into today, but it says the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested Jesus with this question. They said, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And he said, the second's like it. It goes along with it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said, all the law and the prophets, the, the Bible that they had in that day, what we would refer to as the Old Testament, he said, all of those things hang up on these two commandments. Love God first and foremost, and then love your neighbor as yourself. And see, the people that were around that day, they would not have been surprised when Jesus said to love God above all else. As a matter of fact, Jesus was quoting from the book of Deuteronomy, and it was, and it was a prayer, part of a sh the Shema, that Jewish people would have said regularly, often throughout the day, that they were to love the Lord their God with all their heart, soul, mind, strength. Right? But, and then most people wouldn't have been surprised even with the second commandment that Jesus gave, which he was quoting from Leviticus 19, another Old Testament book. And they weren't surprised with that necessarily. And, and they, would, they would have taught to love your family and to love those people that, 
that were close to you. And there might have even been a few teachers that, that went on beyond that and said, you know, you can even love some people outside of your circle, um, but certainly not pagans, certainly not people who believe differently or, or acted differently or, or in seeming opposition to the laws and to the commands of God. They would have said, you know, it doesn't really apply to that. But see, Jesus teaches his followers, and, and he practiced love in a radical and disarming way. So in this series, we're going to focus on the second greatest commandment, which is like the first, to love other people. And, uh, you know, we can't really love God if we don't love others. So they go hand in hand. They're connected. And I would say that in this country, and specifically in this group of people, I don't think anyone would disagree with the fact that we are to love. Right? Everybody says we just need more love, we need more love. I think where we disagree is what that looks like. So during the next four weeks, we're going to look at some scriptures, and we're going to see how Jesus loved, and we're going to try and unpack some things to see what real love looks like through the eyes of God. So I want to start us off this morning with kind of a little test. And again, i got to set up some ground rules. I don't want any comments. I'm going to put some pictures up. I don't want any comments. I, I don't want any boos or hissing or cheering, none of that. I want you guys, remember, we're focusing on ourselves. I want you to pay attention to what's going on in your own mind, what's going on in your own heart. What, what are some things that are bubbling up when you look at these pictures? So let's start off with the first one. All right, let's go to the next one. Okay, let's go to the third one. All right, let's move this next one. I don't know how that one got in there. <laughs> I love those two guys. You know, there should be no booing or hissing or bad thoughts there, except Matt did leave us. I'm still a little bitter, but we'll, we'll move on. So let's go to the next one. Okay, next. All right. And then let's go to this final one. And maybe some booze and hissing is allowed on Super Bowl Sunday on this one. So. But, um, you know, again, what's foundational to Christianity, foundational to our worldview, is a, is a verse that goes all the way back to the very first chapter of Genesis, the first book of the Bible. And Genesis 1.27 says this. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Both male and female, he created them. See, we are fearfully and we are wonderfully made. We are unlike anything else in God's created order. We are the apex of his creation down here on this earth. We're not like animals. See, we feel, we reason, we take the gifts and the abilities that God's given to us, and we actually create artwork and music and things like that. We make choices. We solve problems. We rule over creation. We have dominion. We love and relate to each other in a different way than any other animal that God's created. Because we are created in the image of God, fearfully and wonderfully made. So I'm going to ask you a few questions, and I do want some audience participation on this one. Are white people, black people, Asian people, Native Americans, Latinos, Middle Easterners, are they all created in the image of God? Okay. All right. Are Christians, Muslims, Buddhists, Hindus, Mormons, atheists, are they created in the image of God? Okay. Are Democrats, Republicans, Libertarians, Green Party members, Independents, Anarchists, whatever party, are they created in the image of God? Okay. Liberals, conservatives, moderates, created in the image of God? Okay. Are people who disagree with you created in the image of God? Okay. So I think we've established all men and women, every person that has ever been born, every person you've ever laid, eye, laid eyes on has great worth because they are created in the image of God. God made them and declared that mankind is good. So with that in mind, James, who is a half-brother of Jesus, grew up with Jesus, and he writes this in James chapter 3. He says, with the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. And he says, my brothers and sisters, this should not be. This should not happen. And so this morning as I teach this message, I preach this message, I want you to understand that this is just as much to me as it is to you. And God's been hitting me with this. And, and you know, there's been a lot of things going on in the media. We've come off an election, an election that, you know, it just brings out the 
bad on both sides, and, and there's been all kinds of events going on. And, and lately, a few weeks back, I mean, I was getting on Facebook, and I was looking at the news, and, and it was doing a work on my heart that wasn't good. And I'm reading things, and I'm seeing responses from people, and I'm seeing viewpoints, and, and I'm starting to use words in my mind like idiots, morons, stupid, I mean, evil, these things. And, and just I, I actually had some sleepless nights where i just get so riled up at this stuff that was going on. And I was making a lot of judgments based upon little knowledge and judgments that I had no business making. So my birthday was two Sundays ago, coming into church and and uh, I knew I was going to be preaching in the series, wasn't sure what I was going to be speaking on yet. And uh, as I'm listening to Joy FM, and I'm, I'm actually praising God, and God really, not audibly, but laid two passages of Scripture on my heart. So I got here, and I knew what I was going to speak on, and I started writing notes down two Sunday mornings ago. And this first one is from Luke chapter 7, verses 36 to 50. It says, when one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house, and he reclined at the table. Now, when they would have dinner, they didn't have tables and chairs the way we did. There would be a table. They would recline on, on like a couch and lay on their side with their, their head propped up on their elbow. So you can picture Jesus as he's at dinner doing this. It says, a woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. And I looked that up, and this perfume is very expensive. It's it's some commentary said it's up to like a, a year's worth of wages, so she's sparing no expense bringing this. And, and we don't know what kind of sinful life she lived. Luke says she had a reputation. Tom mentioned last week a passage from Galatians that talks about the acts of the flesh, things that we are prone to do when we are not being led by the Spirit of God. And it listed things like sexual immorality, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, dissensions, envy, drunkenness, orgies. So this woman lived a lifestyle that incorporated some of that. Don't know what it was, but we know that she had a reputation of of not being holy. Story goes on in verse 38. As she stood behind Jesus at his feet weeping, I don't know how she got into this dinner, I don't don't get all that, but she began to wet Jesus' feet with her tears. She wiped them with her hair and kissed them and, and poured this expensive perfume on them. And then when the Pharisee who had invited Jesus saw this, he said to himself, if this man, he says it to himself, if this man were a prophet, if he were a man of God like he says he is, he would know who's touching him and what kind of woman that she is, that she's a sinner. And here's the question, was she a sinner? Yeah, we just established that, right? She was. She might have been a complete mess, and she probably was. She had a reputation, but she must have known the reputation of Jesus as well. At this time, he's gathering large crowds, and and he was known as a friend of sinners, a a tag that the religious people tried to put on him to to kind of mock him that Jesus, I think, wore as a badge of honor. See, this messed up woman, she throws herself at the feet of Jesus, on the mercy of Jesus. He's her only hope, her only hope. He's the one that might help her uh, get the peace and the love that she desperately and I believe desperately was longing for. So then in verse 40, it says, Jesus answered Simon and says, I've got something to tell you. And that's probably not a good position to be in if you're Simon. I mean, this is like going to the principal's office and, in a big way. And, and so Jesus says, Simon, I'm going to be teaching you a lesson here. You might pay attention. And Simon, remember, he had said those things to himself about the woman and about Jesus. He doesn't know that Jesus has heard him or has, has read his mind, however that works. And he says, tell me, teacher. He said, and I can just picture, oh, it's Simon, man, you don't know what you're saying. I mean, it's coming, right? I mean, after all, in his mindset, he's thinking that he's righteous, that he's fulfilling the law of God, that, that he's doing things that are, that are right. And so he, he's on the, the kind of in and, and, and is doing well. And So Jesus, as he so often does masterfully, he tells a story to kind of set things right. Verse 41, he says, Two people owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. And I, and I looked up, a denarius was like a normal day's wages. So in today's time, let's say somebody works for 10 bucks an hour, eight hours a day. Um, a normal day's wages might be 80 bucks. So this one man owed $40,000 and the other man owed $4,000. Story goes, neither of them had the money to pay him back. So he forgave the debts of both. Jesus says, now, which of them 
will love him more. And Simon replied, I, I, I suppose it's the one who has the bigger debt. He, would, he will love more. And Jesus says, you've judged correctly. And, and that's, I would think that way too, right? If somebody comes and forgives my home mortgage versus like a car payment, I'm going to be jacked up about that one, right? So you're going to love them more. Verse 44, then Jesus turns toward the woman and he says to Simon, do you, do you see this woman? Simon, I came into your house and you didn't give me water for my feet. But she wet my feet with her tears and and wiped them with her hair. Simon, you didn't give me a kiss. But this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. Simon, you didn't put oil on my head, but she's poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, Simon, her many sins have been forgiven as her great love is shown. But whoever has been forgiven little loves little. And I think we can also understand that who has ever been forgiven much, whoever understands that they have been forgiven much, loves much. See, Jesus knows how to put self-righteous people in their place. Jesus tells Simon, this Pharisee, this religious leader, he says, this woman, Simon, this sinner who's got a reputation, this lady from the wrong side of the tracks, who everyone knows has been up to some pretty shady things, this woman hasn't stopped loving on me since she walked through the doors. He says, Simon, this woman is a greater love of people than you rule-following Pharisee are. He says, what a slam. I mean, Jesus just slams Simon, and yet it's a slam that's based on truth. And he goes on in verse 48, and he says to her, your sins are forgiven. And the other guests that are there watching this, they start to, to murmur and to say among themselves, I mean, who is this guy? Who is this man that even forgives sins? And Jesus says to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. He says to the woman, because you've had the right attitude, because you've had the right mindset, because you know that, that I am the one that you need to come to, that I am your hope, that I am the only one that can, that can forgive you, that can set things right, that can clean you up. He says, because of that, your sins are forgiven. Now go in peace. Now this woman, she knew that she was a mess, but she was poor in spirit. She was humble. She knew that she had nowhere else to turn but to Jesus. See, she understood her true condition much better than the Pharisee did much better than the religious leader understood. This sinful woman, she was humble. She was honest. She was heartbroken. Jesus acknowledged her sin. He didn't excuse it. He didn't wipe it away, wash it away. He he forgave her. He didn't want want her to continue in those sinful, destructive patterns, but he forgave her because of her attitude, because of her faith in him. And see, I think he teaches us a principle in this story. When we have the right mindset, when we understand the condition that we're in for what it is, when we quit comparing ourselves to other people, when we quit keeping an incorrect scorecard that's based upon pious self-righteousness, when we acknowledge the wretchedness of our sin, the visible and the invisible, then we're filled with gratitude for God's mercy and for his grace. And see, our focus turns not on other people, but to him and his goodness and and his mighty love. And that allows us to see people through the eyes of God, that they are fellow image bearers who are struggling along with us, that every single person is one who God loves deeply. And see, then I think with that attitude, with that mindset, with that humility, with that poor in spirit uh, attention, then I think we can fulfill the second greatest commandment and love others freely and well, regardless of their beliefs, regardless of the lifestyle that they might live, regardless of whether or not they agree with us. So loving others starts with this mindset, with the right attitude, realizing our desperate need for the Savior, for the King of the world, when we're humble and poor in spirit. So then I had a second passage that that God brought to my attention, and it's Luke chapter 18. It goes on uh, a few chapters later, 18. It says, to some who are confident of their own righteousness and look down on everyone else. So those who thought they had it all together, those who think that they're better than other people, those who judge with the imperfect standard, Jesus is addressing them. He tells them this parable. He says, two men went up to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee, we know what they were like, and the other was a tax collector. Now tax collectors were the low of lows. 
They were national traders. They were Jewish people that collected taxes for the Roman government. So they would take their fellow countrymen's money and they would send it off to the, the foreign government who was, who was occupying this land. And not only that, they made most of their living by skimming their people for more than what they actually owed. So they would send taxes off to Rome, but they would keep extra that they, that they took off of their fellow countrymen. So we might have a dislike for the IRS. Put that on steroids and you'd understand what people thought of with tax collectors. Jesus says in verse 11, the Pharisee, this religious guy, he stands by himself and he prays and says, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, that I'm not like those robbers, those evildoers, those adulterers, or even like this tax collector. He says, I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all that I get. So in other words, he's saying, I, I look pretty good on the outside. I mean, I do my religious duties, and, and if I may so myself, I do them pretty well. Jesus goes on. But the tax collector, this hated, treacherous tax collector, he stands at a distance. He wouldn't even look up to heaven. He says he beats his breast. He says, God, have mercy on me. I'm a sinner. He says, I messed up. I don't have anywhere else to go. I need you. I need your forgiveness, your love. And then Jesus says, verse 14, I tell you that this man, this tax collector, this sinner, rather than the other, went home justified before God. And see, what a shock that would have been to the people listening to that story. I mean, this cheating traitor is declared righteous in God's sight. While the godly, supposedly godly, rule-following uh, religious man is the villain in the story. And it's all because of this attitude. All because of this humble, poor in spirit mindset. He goes on and says, For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. See, if we want to love others well, we've got to start with the right mindset. We can't say, look at that scumbag. Look at that idiot. Look at that person that looks different, thinks different, acts different. He doesn't get it. He needs to come to my way of thinking. He comes to my side of the fence in order for me to love him. And that's not the right way. See, when we realize our own sin, that we're no different than anybody else but by the grace of God, when we understand the undeserved forgiveness that we gain from God, then we can look at other people and realize that they are created in the image of God as people who have great worth. I'm going to have a group come up, uh, a couple of people come up and sing a song, and the, the message isn't over. I'm going to come up afterwards, but I'm stealing this from the edge last Sunday night. And they give you a time, uh, and I'm going to give you a time during the song. I want you just to really examine your heart, to really examine your attitude, to really think in this culture that's going on now with just hatred being spewed from all sides. I want you to think where you're at. Because, see, as followers of Jesus Christ, we are supposed to be known for the love that we have for other people. That's what's to mark us. I want to read from Philippians chapter 2. This is the Apostle Paul writing. He says, in your relationships with one another, I want you to have the mindset, the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow on heaven and earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. See, we know that Jesus came for sinners. He came for you. He came for me. He came for liars. He came for those of us who are sexually immoral. He came for those who are posers, those who are fakes, those who are gluttons, those who are gossips. He came for the Pharisees. He came for every single one of us because we're all a mess and we all need God. So we're going to go into this prayer time. And again, I talked at the beginning, I hope that we have repentant hearts. And if this has convicted you, then good. It has me. And I want you to take some time to really think about how you're going to adjust your mindset, how you're going to adjust your heart and follow Christ the way that he is supposed to be followed and to love other people the way that he wants us to love them. 
So I'm going to say a prayer. They're going to sing this song, a new song, a beautiful song that Josh gave me that's got great lyrics on how we are to love. And I want you to use this time as a time of prayer, and then I'm going to come up again. So, dear Father, just pray. I pray that you uh, use your word, use your stories, use the examples that Jesus gave us uh, to convict us, to, to set us on the right course. And, uh, Father, I pray that we have humble hearts. I pray that we have a mindset that is poor in spirit, that we understand that our only hope, like the woman, like the tax collector, is Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Thank you, guys. That was awesome. Yesterday, I was up here in the morning. We had a parents' conference, and then I was here kind of cleaning up and then practicing for today. And about 4 o'clock, uh, I get into my car, head out, make a left out here on Richardson, go through the stoplight there in front of Culver's, and all of a sudden, coming out of Culver's parking lot is a police officer with his lights on and gets behind me. And I'm hoping it's not me. 
and I turn into the parking lot of the movie theater, and it was me. And uh, comes up behind me, and I'm thinking, man, I hope this is a cop that really goes to Oak Ridge, right? And so, um, so I'm sitting there, and uh, he comes up to me, and, and I knew why he'd pulled me over. And he comes up, and he says, do you, do you know what I pulled you over for? And, and I knew I hadn't been speeding. I knew I hadn't gone through the stoplight. But I knew that my license plates expired in December. So I said, yeah, I, I think I've got a pretty good idea. And I said, but, but I've, I've got an explanation. I said, see, I, at the beginning, it's, I drive an old beat-up car that was actually Tom's daughter's first car like 10 years ago. It's got like 200,000 miles on it. And I didn't drive it at the beginning of January because my daughters didn't have school, so there were cars available. And I said, and then the, the car kind of broke down, and I need to get some things done for it to pass inspection. So I had a buddy do these things to get it to pass inspection. Then last Monday, I took it up to get it done. They fixed a few more things to get it to pass, but it failed emissions because my buddy had just put a new battery in it and the battery needs time to reset. So the people at the place told me that if I drove it for like a week and brought it back in, there would probably be no problem. And I pulled out the, the paperwork to prove it to him. And, uh, and, as, and as he came up and he looked at my license and when I started talking, all of a sudden he goes, do you go to Oak Bridge? And I was like, yes, all right, you know, yeah. And I said, yeah, I do. As a matter of fact, I was just there practicing on my message for tomorrow. And, uh, and he says, I go there. And I said, great, I do too, you know. And he goes, I love that place. And I said, awesome, God, thank you. I love this place too. And, uh, and he says, you know, I just, I really like the messages and the music and just the whole thing. I said, well, how long have you been coming? He said, I've been coming for like six months. Another one of the police officers that work here has started coming and, and they invited me and now my family comes and, and he goes, we just love it. And he says, you know, Tom, Pastor Tom gave a message a while back and uh, he said it, it, it was a great message and I still remember it. And he goes, see, in my line of work, it's easy for me to start just kind of getting cynical and looking down on people. And, and he actually used this word and he goes, you know, sometimes I just kind of think of people as idiots. And uh, he said, and Tom gave a message a while back where he talked about that we're all created in the image of God. And I said, really? You know, and then he said, yeah, and it really convicted me. And I pulled out my sermon and I said, you're talking like exactly what I'm talking about tomorrow. That was my first line. I wanted to be convicting. And then I showed him the image of God passage. And, and, and he goes on. He said, yeah, it's, it's, it's just awesome. And he goes, and then I remember Tom talking about that we're, you know, treasured children of the most high God. And he says that, that he goes, you know, I, that made me really think. And again, convicted me. He says, I've got two little kids. And he says, if somebody says something against those kids or if they treat my kids bad, he goes, I'm ready to go. And he said, and then I thought, you know, how must God feel when a person that he's created in his image that's his child that he loves so much, when I say something bad about them or, or treat them wrong? And he said, so... I carry around, and he showed me his keychain. He goes, I, I carry around this yellow hose that you guys gave out. And I said, yeah, here are my keys. So do I, you know? And, and so we talked for a little while, Lauren. He goes, maybe this is why I pulled you over. And, and again, I, I don't really think there's many coincidences in this. And I think God was confirming a message that, that I wanted to give, that I've needed in my own life, and that I think many of us in here needed to hear. So he proceeds to give me the ticket. And, no, he didn't. I, I just, that was awesome. I get, thank you, God. I got off for a warning. And, uh, but he said, you know, when, when he was saying that, I said, man, you ought to come up and just preach my message. And, and honestly, I, I think he just did. It was a pretty cool, pretty weird, one of those God moments as we were talking. And it just reminded me of just the importance of, of putting into practice the things that God speaks of. See, as followers of Jesus Christ, we're called in the scriptures to be known for our love for one another. And I think so often we just get caught up into things and, and we, you know, just spew out the hate things against other image bearers that Jesus says, you have no place. You're acting like people that don't know me. And see, I think that he would say, if you do that, you're really no better than the Pharisees. And I think he would have some harsh words for us. He says, I have created all people. They're my creation. I care about them. And it hurts me when you hurt them. So I want you to stick with this series because it is so key for us to learn to love the way that Jesus would want us to love. So that people can look on this body, so that people can look at Christians 
not thinking that we're hate-filled, but thinking that we are loving people. And then we can point people to the one that, that has come into our lives and made all the difference, Jesus Christ. So that's what this is so important. And there's one passage, Romans chapter 5, that I want to end with. It says, God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We're all level at the foot of the cross. We all need help. We all need a Savior. We're all messed up. Anything good in my life is only because the grace of God that is active. So I hope you've been convicted today. I hope you think of some attitudes that you need to adjust and that we head down a different path and that we rock this world with the love of Jesus Christ. Hang with us this series, and uh, I think we're going to learn a lot. So let's, let's go to God in prayer. Dear Father, uh, I just pray for myself, and I pray for people in here that, that Father, we, uh, we are just concerned about doing what you want us to do. And I know, God, sometimes we get caught up in our own agendas, and we think that we can argue people around, and we think that we can bully people, and we, we just treat each other the way that we are not to be treated, to the direct opposite of what you would say. So, Father, help us to have humble hearts, Help us to have the right mindset as we look at other people, whether they agree with us or not. And Father, we know that you will honor that and that when we are humble, that you will exalt us and that you will lift us up. And we are grateful for that. We need your care. We need your love. We need to be changed, Father, from the inside out. So we thank you for the power that comes through your son, through his spirit. Help us to be submissive, and to just be open to the changes that we need to make. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's stand up and sing.
Well, we've got a great start into this series, The Love Like Jesus. And I just wanted to say something to all of you. I want you to hear this clearly. I'm so proud of all of you in our church because of four words. Four words. They're on the back wall. It's all about Jesus. To learn to love people, I don't need CNN. I don't need Fox News. I don't need MSNBC. I don't need ABC. I don't need public radio. I don't need CBS. I just need to know Jesus more and trust him more and live the way he says to live. That's what we need. Every single one of us. We can turn to the pages of scripture and we can see how Jesus loved and we can see how we should love and we can see the power that changes the world, that changes a heart, my heart, your heart. Next week, Josh is going to zero in on how to love like Jesus and forgiveness. And I just am so glad to see what God's doing and in my heart, already this morning, thank you, Herc. Band, thank you for your music and your songs. And uh, I just know he's going to continue to work with us. So, um, Father, I just want to thank you. I want to pray your blessings upon everybody here. Help us to trust your son, to surrender to him, to learn from him, to grow in him, to love like him. Father, we thank you for this time, and we know that you can change our hearts and move us in that direction. So in the name of your son, we pray. Amen. Real quickly, how many of you... For tonight, it's important for you that the Patriots win. Raise your hand. Let me see. Hold on. How many of you tonight, it's important for you that the Falcons win? Raise your hand. How many of you tonight, it's important that the food tastes good? See you guys next week. Thanks for coming. Yeah.